failure is just stepping stones to making something incredible. And people shouldn't be afraid of trying something themselves um, just because they, they don't think it's going to be good enough or that it's going to be, you know, they're, they're going to fail at it. The answer is you might, you know, and it might not be good enough. As long as you still have that drive to increase your skills and to make something better next time, it's not a failure. It's just a stepping stone to something really cool. Hey friends, welcome back to the Guitar Max channel. So in the past couple of years, there has been a huge increase in the amount of people who have started playing guitar and other instruments. It's only natural that some of these musicians are going to want to start bands. But the thing is, it's not the 1980s anymore or anywhere even close to that. And the old school ways of starting and launching a band are just not going to cut it in modern times. So what does it take to start and run a successful band in 2022? That's the question I'm going to answer in this video. Now you might be thinking, Max, you just play guitar on the internet. What do you know about running bands? And although I have been in many bands over the years, you would still have a valid point. Fortunately for all of us, my friend and musical collaborator Ty Christian has agreed to join us for this video and help answer those questions. In addition to being the lead vocalist of the band Lords of the Trident, Ty also has a series of videos out called Words of Fang, where he provides valuable advice to aspiring musicians and up and coming bands. And the bottom line is that he has been doing this successfully for years. He has helped many people over the years and he has taken his own band, Lords of the Trident, from being a local level band to a band that has toured internationally, released multiple full-length albums, and even had record deals. Okay guys, so we're gonna dive right into this here, but real quick, if you enjoy videos like this and you have not already subscribed, please consider subscribing right now. Okay, now let's talk to Ty and see what he has to say about starting a band in 2022. Okay, so Ty, like I've talked about on a lot of other videos in the past couple of years, there have been huge numbers in terms of guitar sales and musical instrument sales. A lot of people are starting to play music that they've never been, you know, when they've never been playing it before. So I'm imagining that we're going to be getting a lot of new bands coming out in the next couple of years. So the thing I really want to do with this video is give people, you know, some information and some tools that they can use to start a band, but in a modern, you know, in a modern setting, because there are so many things have changed in the past, you know, 10 or 20 years in terms of the music industry. And uh, obviously, I think you've got a lot of valuable information, uh, you know, for people starting out like this. But the thing I, I want to start with is, you know, realistically, what does a successful band look like in 2022? Because I've got the feeling that it's not exactly the, you know, uh, limousine with the jacuzzi in the back and that kind of stuff that you know, we had back in the 80s and 90s. So what does success look like in 2020 for a band? Wait a minute, are you telling me that I can't get my limousine with my hot tub in the back? That's terrible. Like, you've just shattered all of my realities here, Max. Come on, what are you doing? <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm not saying you can't do that, but uh, I, I just don't know if that is the... the uh... That's, that's not a reasonable trajectory for any band. And I mean, it's not going to happen anymore. There's no more gold-plated Shark Tank hot tub uh, bars uh floating around anymore i mean so what does success look like for a band uh nowadays there's 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 really been a a real sea change uh from thinking about bands as these these mega mega gigantic stars that play arenas to really focusing more on what people have liked to call the, the middle class musician um the nice thing about the internet is that it has really opened up the doors so that you know if you create music if you create art of any kind uh you can get that music out there you can get that art out there and you can find people who resonate with it where i think people go wrong in terms of thinking about the trajectory of their band is they think more on that metallica level they think oh you know we're gonna play these shows and we're gonna get picked up by a label and we're gonna start touring the globe and we're gonna make a, a million dollars and blah 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 and we're gonna be playing at stadiums every night that sort of thing just doesn't really happen too much anymore. I, I really can't think of too many bands that have come out, say, in the last 10 years or so, five, 10 years or so, that are out, you know, 
touring gigantic stadiums selling out places like happened in in the 80s and 90s what's happening now is really a lot more towards uh finding you know maybe 100 to 200 to 500 fans that will do things like directly support you whether that is on like kickstarter or indiegogo or patreon uh like i use um finding that niche and finding that that small or you know small to medium size it, I'm, I'm talking in terms of like internet size right so small maybe you know 50,000 people to 100,000 people who are absolutely crazy about your band and making your living off of you know that subset of people instead of relying on you know millions and millions and millions of people around the world knowing about your band that's the real big difference today in terms of thinking about success as a band thinking of it more on a small scale more as like a cultivated you know almost one might call it a cult following is, is the mindset that, that most bands have to get into uh, in order to in order to survive if they are going to be eventually playing stadiums you know for hundreds of thousands of people you got to start by cultivating a small group of you know say 5,000 people who are, are crazy enough about you to get you know your band names uh, tattooed on their butt I mean, I, I think when people hear you say that or, or talk about it like that, I think it might sound to them like, oh, you're lowering your expectations or something like that. But I think something that maybe people don't uh, consider is that the sort, that sort of old style, you know, the old style music industry, legacy uh, music industry, even when those big bands, you know, had all this a sort of success in like a visual sense or something like you you know you see them in the magazines and stuff a lot of those musicians most of them were not really making very much money sometimes no money at all sometimes they were just going in debt so i think what you're talking about this sort of direct to fans kind of connection right where it's a very a ve like you said a very dedicated but smaller audience i mean i think w ultimately what happens is you can have more financial success with that kind of a setup and obviously you have a lot more control over it as an artist than you would going you know back in you know 1998 or something with some big record label yeah absolutely uh really the only thing that record labels are good for nowadays is giving a band an ethereal stamp of like legitimacy um you know the the we run into this problem all the time uh, we will will email a festival, you know, seeing if we if we want to play, and and I guarantee you that you know it's, if it's coming from Lords of the Trident at gmail.com, it usually goes in the trash bin. If it was to come in from you know Lords of the Trident at Napalm Records or Century Media or something like that, then you know they we have this ethereal stamp of legitimacy, and all of a sudden they'll give us a second look. Um, Nothing about the band has changed. The music hasn't changed. The the uh, uh, ability to perform hasn't changed by signing to a label. It's just that ethereal stamp of legitimacy. What you give up in exchange for that ex ethereal stamp of legitimacy is huge. You give up ownership of your music. Sometimes until the end of time, you give up ownership of your music. You give up 90% of your income, not only from like royalties, but a lot of people don't know, you know, labels will take uh, cuts from your merch booth. Labels will take cuts from any sponsorship deals you do. Labels sometimes will take streaming revenue from even like Twitch or YouTube live streams in some of these new 360 deals. Um, so you give up so much control over your own destiny by just thinking about it in an old way and signing to a label um, that I, I honestly can't really see too many situations where it's worth it. Um, at the end of the day, all of us as musicians are my main goal, and I think the main goal of 99% of musicians out there is to be able to make a living off of our music, is to be able to like pay our mortgage, eat normal food, maybe have a beer every once in a while. You know, we don't have to live crazy, lavish lifestyles. We just want to be able to survive and do what we love full time. And if you really think about it in that way, you don't need 500 million people, you know, buying your albums to do that. You really only need a small group of very dedicated fans uh, supporting you financially uh, in order to make that rea that into reality. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. I think that is what the vast majority of musicians want. And I mean, like, I'm, I'm on the same, you know, I, I'm exactly like that. That's what I would like. You know, that's, 
you know, and I've, I've sort of, I mean, if you, I think we can talk about this more later on, but I mean, obviously social media and YouTube, that kind of stuff can be very important to a band uh, or a musician, you know, getting themselves out there and that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, just the, the idea that you can basically play your instrument or sing and from that alone, you can support yourself and, and you know, live, a, live a, a happy and comfortable life. That sounds like a great life to me. Oh, 100%. That's all I want. <laughs> I just want to I want to I want to sing my stupid songs. I want to look dumb on the internet and I and and I want to be able to pay my mortgage. That's it. You know. Also cat food for the cat. That's also need that. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, so like I said at the beginning, there's going to be a lot of people who are starting bands for the first time and they're going to be maybe starting a band that is a brand new band, you know, they're not necessarily uh, joining an existing band. So I think that situation is really challenging for a lot of people because it's like, how do you start when you have no audience at all? Like, how do you how do you start just from zero, and then you start building an audience uh, and getting the word out? I mean, what's I mean, how do you do that when you when you're just starting from scratch? The easiest the easiest way to grow your audience when you are a brand new band that's never done anything before at all is is by going out to other band shows and making friends with them. Uh, especially bands in your own genre, and then setting up a show with like that band and your band. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people give the advice, oh, make make friends with a band and then have them invite you onto a show. And it's like that's fine, but then they have to do the work, you know. And and they may not like fully like trust you as a band yet because you're brand new, so they don't know if you're if if you're any good, to be honest. Um, the one way to alleviate that is you set up the show, you invite them, you say, hey, uh, you know, I really want to, the, the breakneck hussies on my, you know, CD release party. So, you know, I'm going to set this up and uh, can you guys do it? Um, and then you become friends with them. Uh, and it, it's, it's that slow crawl of becoming friends with the other bands in your city, putting together shows and basically introducing yourself to their fan base in hopes that you know some of their fan base will become your fan base as well. Um, you know, bands bands are not a, music is not a competition. Bands are not a zero sum game. Um, people can be fans of your band and another band at the same time and be and that be perfectly valid. Um, and and honestly, the the number one thing that's grown Lords of the Trident, uh, especially over the past couple of years, especially with COVID, has been cultivating and crafting um, very close relationships with other bands in our genre uh, and and supporting the things that they do. Um, it, it's been fantastic because we've been able to share our audience with them and their audience gets shared with us and it's a win-win for everybody. Um, so definitely finding other bands, befriending them and doing the legwork to put together a show for you and them uh, is the easiest way to start to grow from scratch. Obviously you need good songs. Obviously, you need to think about you know how your stage performance looks and, and make sure that all of that is polished before you hit the stage for the first time, so that you give off a good impression, so that they want to play with you again. But that's an easy way to start, kind of from scratch, uh, is doing that. I, I think also you know a band really should pay attention to uh, really should pay attention to um, you know how they how they brand themselves. Um, so thinking about color scheme, thinking about what they're wearing on stage, thinking about, you know, their font choices, their, their logo, how they present themselves, all that sort of thing can help to be almost sort of like a homing beacon to people who may be interested in your band, in your genre, in what you're trying to do. By communicating that effectively, you're, you're giving, it, it, it creates easy access for people who want to find out more about what, about what you're doing and who you are. You know, so I'm, I'm kind of in shock to hear this because I have a lead singer who's telling me that it's not all about you. <laughs> well, it, it's of course all about me, but, um, you know, the other little people out there, well, you still have to be friends with them, you know. Okay, so the other part of this, right, is if you are having this, you know, this small uh, group of, you know, rabid fans that are, that are supporting you with this kind of stuff, you're probably going to end up doing, you know, because there's not a big label involved or a big agency and, you know, management companies and that kind of stuff, musicians these days end up wearing a lot of different hats, right? And there's a lot of different skills 
that they need in order to make this happen, um, as opposed to in the past when you really could just focus on writing songs and you know and performing your best and and not much else. Um, so today, you know, what are the most important skills you would say that musicians need to succeed these days? Um, I think I, I truly think that musicians can basically do nearly everything themselves for uh, for their own band. And I think, you know, what are the most important skills that someone needs to focus on in 2020? It really comes down to how much money they're comfortable spending on their band. If they have, you know, oodles of money and they want to throw it at the band, then they really don't have to learn how to make flyers in Photoshop, how to, you know, set up cameras for live streaming, how to make music videos and get on the internet. They can just throw money at it. But the reality is, is that most of us, you know, uh, in, in the music industry are, are more in the starving musician camp <laughs> than, than in the oodles of money camp. And so I think, you know, being able to learn how to do things yourself and having the having having almost sort of the fearlessness to try something and see if it succeeds is is something that can be cultivated and should be cultivated by a lot of musicians that want to be successful in this sort of new music industry. Um, if I had to nail it down to just a couple of certain things that I would say personally for me are more important, uh, number one would almost certainly be video. Uh, a large majority of the way that people share and listen to music and and get exposed to new music is through things like YouTube and TikTok and you know also and and Instagram and all sorts of different uh, social media, right? And in order to be successful on social media, you need media. <laughs> so being comfortable shooting you know your own videos, even if it's just on a cell phone, or being comfortable um, creating that sort of uh, uh, video based content to go with your music is probably one of the most important things to cultivate uh, now and going forward. And it's just getting easier. You know, you don't, you don't need crazy, amazing camera setups and, and all that sort of stuff. Most of the lighting that I started off with when I started doing this was like, you know, bulbs that I put in inside of like screwed into like old tin cans. So like there, there's, there's ways to DIY nearly everything to make it look, you know, sometimes more than halfway decent. Uh, and 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 create that sort of uh, presence that you want um, online to get people to hear your music. So yeah, I'd say I'd say video is is almost certainly the the number one that I would uh, that I would say. So it sounds like I mean video a specific thing, but the other thing you were really talking about there is just that sort of willingness to do things yourself and to try things on your own and that kind of stuff. Yeah, the nice thing about living in today's day and age is that you know we have YouTube, and you can type in, and we have Google, and you can type in how to do whatever. If I wanted to become a, a apprentice plumber tomorrow, I could probably learn about 90% of what I need to know uh, to be successful in doing that just by watching YouTube videos. And I mean, the same goes for literally any, any sort of thing that you want to learn online, especially band stuff. You can be proficient in recording your own guitar probably in 48 hours of watching a bunch of YouTubers teach you about EQ and compression and how to place mics and all that sort of stuff. Um, the barriers to entry have been basically eliminated for just about any discipline. And what it comes down to after that is just willingness to learn, you know, the time to throw into, uh, into figuring out what the discipline's all about, and then just trial and error. So many people are afraid to try something because they don't think it'll work out. And the reality of it is, and I'm sure you know, you and I have dealt with this a million times, when something doesn't work out, you learn from it, and the next thing you make is even better because you now know what not to do you know, from, from the last time that you failed. Failure is just stepping stones to making something incredible. And people shouldn't be afraid of trying something themselves um, just because they, they don't think it's going to be good enough or that it's going to be, you know, they're, they're going to fail at it. The answer is you might, you know, and it might not be good enough. As long as you still have that drive to increase your skills and to make something better next time, it's not a failure. It's just a stepping stone to something really cool. Awesome. Well, that's going to be the teaser right there for the video. That's going to be good. <laughs>
<laughs> I was feeling it when I was saying it. I'm like, here it is. Here, here you go, Max. <laughs> Okay, so another question I want to ask you has to do with, again, you know, a, a brand new band when you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, maybe the style you want to go with and branding, like you said. So this question is, can a new band be successful if it's created as a derivative of other successful bands? And I'll give you an example of this that I see all the time. Steel Panther. I have heard probably a hundred times People tell me, hey, we're going to start a new band and it's going to be like Steel Panther, but different. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think it's like, well, people, they look at Steel Panther and it's like, hey, there's a really successful band and they're having a really good time that looks like a lot of fun. I want to do that too. So I'm going to do what they're doing. And if, if they're successful and I'm doing that, then I'll be successful too. What do you think about that? Is that how it works or do you just end up with a bunch of copycat bands? Yeah, I think this is a this is a touchy subject for a lot of people because obviously art is not created in a vacuum. So all bands that that are created, even those that you would think of as like intensely original, uh, their their influences come from somewhere. Their 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 sound is derivated from you know a bunch of the other music and bands that they've heard previously. So uh, you know I think I think this sort of specific example that you gave there. Uh, is 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 a little bit more you know it, it's a little less touchy of a, of an example than saying like you know uh, uh, is your band derivative of something else because like my band is very derivative of like other bands in the genre as as are other bands out there so I don't think people need to be afraid of uh, creating music that sounds like bands that they love or are influenced by because that's just kind of how music works but in the in the example of a band that is a almost near perfect copy another great example of this right airborne from australia is is acdc right they are 100 percent just acdc um greta van fleet right a lot of people think they are basically just led zeppelin and in a lot of instances in that they are correct right they sound and look and act and feel like Led Zeppelin or like ACDC. And that has gotten those bands a decent amount of success. However, the problem with creating a like a direct copy band, right, is that you will never be able to escape the association between your band and the old famous band. So you can have success being a, a direct copy, a direct derivation of, of a specific band. Um, but you got to know that the success is going to be along the lines of like a really good cover band, you know, like people who love you, love you because you sound exactly like ACDC, not because you are, you know, in, in their eyes, in their minds, a completely new project. And you, you still have, you also have that double-edged sword when you go to, you know, break out of that mold when you go to create your own thing you know like oh my god everybody's saying we sound like led zeppelin uh i'm gonna create some you know blackened industrial techno like then you then you immediately alienate all the people who liked you for being a copy of led zeppelin so it, it's i i personally don't think being a completely you know one-to-one -one copy of an existing band is a good idea um because it pigeonholes you into into those problems um but i think if you if you wear your influences on your sleeve if you give nods to your influences without letting them completely take over your sound i think that's a better idea of 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 being like a derivative of a band uh rather than trying to copy exactly what they did one to one awesome well ty I really want to thank you for you know carving the time out of your schedule to do this video. I think this stuff is going to be really helpful for you know all these new musicians coming out and new bands they're going to be putting together. Um, you know, like we kind of talked about in the beginning, there's an old way of doing things and a new way, and the old way really just doesn't work anymore. And so again, thanks a ton for you know giving the people this valuable information. Absolutely, thanks for having me. Anytime. Okay guys, so that was some super valuable information. Now, let's go ahead and just do a quick recap of the main points here. Number one, 
Focus on attracting a small to medium size but highly devoted fan base. Fewer, more supportive fans are better than more, less supportive fans. Number two, collaboration with other artists is key, especially when you're just starting out. Concentrate on building good relationships with other bands. Number three, be willing to do things yourself, such as creating merch, shooting your own videos, promoting the band. Be open to learning the skills you need to do these things. And number four, it's fine to be influenced and inspired by other bands, but have a variety of influences, not just one, and use those influences to give you a general direction to go in instead of an exact template to copy. So guys, I'm gonna put a bunch of links down in the video description below. In particular, I'm gonna have a link down there for Ty's YouTube channel. You can check out some of the music he's working on and also some of those videos he's done. He even has a program that he's been working on with Spectra Sound Studios, that's like Glenn Fricker's channel. And uh, he's developed a program basically just, you know, teaching all of this stuff and, you know, really how to run a band. So that's a new thing down there. I'm going to have a link down there for that as well. Guys, thanks a ton for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it valuable. I really did. You know, I really learned a lot just from talking with Ty in that interview. So, guys, if you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll talk to you soon.